This notebook was found at the scene of the crime. It is believed to be written by the survivor. My phone is dead. I managed to write out what happened and put it up, but I couldn't tell how many people replied. Maybe one of them out there has the answer. But since all I have is this notebook, I'll try to keep track of what's going on. Right now, things are calm. We're all hungry, though. We have no idea what we're doing. It was a knee-jerk reaction to pick corners and stay there. David is livid. He wants to leave. He keeps suggesting that we should go our separate ways and pretend we never heard of these non-human entities. To be honest, I kind of hear his point. Do I really believe in monsters? Nate is pretty quiet. He seems sad and maybe a bit numb. Harold is talkative, like always. He's trying to solve the situation. It's very calming to hear him talk. We've been best friends for years now. I trust him implicitly. I'm gonna try to get some sleep now. We figured out a way to get food from the kitchen. Nate and Harold went in together, while Dan and I guarded the living room. They all brought out non-perishable food. From the pantry dumped it on the floor. Unfortunately, we're a bunch of guys in our late 20s, so most of what we have are snack foods. Dan laid out a plan to ration the food. He's always been good with numbers, and it seemed fair. I have to be honest. After two days with no food, a bag of chips, I devoured tasted better than anything I ever had. Even the Mountain Dew is delicious. We are still no closer to figuring out who the imposter is. As time goes by, I'm starting to wonder if there is an imposter. I know these four guys. I have memories with them. I thought of one of them not being... Not human. Is... Dan is dead. I'll write more soon. Finally, I have some time to write this out. The others are suspicious of me writing because of all the notes we found. I told him I'm keeping a record of what's happened, but Harold is especially concerned. I don't think he trusts me anymore. Like I said, Dan is dead. It was an accident. He got mad and tried to leave. Harold and I blocked him. Nate pushed him backwards, and he hit his head against the desk. The crack was horrible. His head hung like an overripe fruit before his body fell to the floor. He must have died instantly. The moments after, we sat in distressed silence. I was too surprised to feel panicked. The other two retreated back into their corners. I couldn't stop standing. Harold wanted to call someone. They argued that we would be arrested. Harold said maybe we should be. Their argument petered out as we all stared at Dan's lifeless body. I'd never seen a dead body before. He looked so natural. There was no blood or anything. He just looked like he had collapsed. And given some time, he might stand up again. That was three days ago. He doesn't look normal anymore. And he smells awful. I'm so thirsty. Mom, I love you. I'm so sorry. I don't know how we got here. Please forgive me. 
if you're reading this, I have the feeling I'm dead. And please don't let me rot in the living room like Dan. Please save me. Nate killed himself while I was sleeping. I woke up to Harold screaming. Nate had slashed his wrist with a pair of scissors. Harold started to cry. He explained that he had dozed off and Nate must have done it while he was asleep. Nate was lying there peacefully on his back, his eyes closed, his mouth in a smile. I could almost feel what he was feeling. He had escaped. I held back tears. Harold was sobbing and begging me to forgive him. I told him Nate would have done it. If we were awake or not, we couldn't have saved him. I didn't really believe that. I stood warily. Our food was about to run out. Our small trips for water were not enough for hydration. But it was done. I told Harold it was over. Obviously, I knew Harold was real. So we could finally leave this place and find help. But Harold said no. He said it wasn't time yet. I didn't understand. My mind was too tired to fight. I sat back in my corner. Maybe tomorrow. I want to go home. Something's wrong with Harold. I stabbed him 20 times and he won't die. The skin in his back has a split. His bones are breaking. He's bleeding blue. It sounds like wet bare feet. I think Harold is a cocoon. He's emerging. He looks hungry. Mom, please. I'm sorry. It is a soft, wet sound. In your fingers, it would feel like wet, damp velvet. Red. Drenched in something cold. Maybe water. Maybe something thicker. It smells of fresh earth or dying worms. The stifled sound of filling the host's fingers, putting yourself in its legs, stretching out in the shoulders, ripping the skin that doesn't fit. It tastes like wood shavings, slowly grating the back of your throat. For human eyes, it would look like a new language. Something unvernathably alien that demands to be seen on the edge of your blade. Blue is the color you see before you die. I don't do what humans do. I don't find it funny when the squirming ends. And the suit is ready for wearing. Michael Thomas was found at his address after his mother called the police. He was unharmed. Although the same could not be said for his two roommates. He was brought to a mental health facility, where he will serve a mandatory 30 days. The police have decided the deaths were accidental in the case of Daniel, and self-inflicted in the case of Nathan. No charges have been filed against Michael. Despite his apparent good health, Michael has been acting strangely. He won't stop talking about the ill fit of his skin. Hopefully the psych ward will do him some good.